Brothers and sisters, most of you are probably familiar with the background of Brother Gary Miller, but for the benefit of those who are not, I like to tell you that he is a Muslim and comes from a land far away called Canada. He was one time an ardent missionary for the Christian Church, and strange though it may seem, it was work connected with this activity that led him to embrace Islam in 1978. Being a mathematician, amongst other things, he leads a very busy life. He took a year off from the university where he teaches mathematics to champion the cause of Islam in many parts of the world. That year has now stretched into two years and pretty soon he will be getting back to the university to teach again. At the end of Brother Gary Miller's talk, we have allowed time for a question and answer session in order to enable you to clarify any point that you wish to. For this purpose, we have provided a mic and we would be pleased if you will use it. The question time is open to both Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And we urge you to take advantage of this opportunity and would be very happy if you are brief and concise in your question. I ask that, I assure you that Brother Gary Miller will be very comprehensive in his reply. I have not gone into a lengthy introduction for two reasons. One of which is that Brother Gary Miller prefers to get down to brass tacks as soon as possible. And the other is that he doesn't need in one anymore since most of you are already familiar with him. So I take great pleasure in inviting Brother Gary Miller to address you. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. As uh, the brother said, maybe some of you have heard uh, something before from me, maybe uh, here or on a piece of tape. I have people coming to me sometimes and they say, I heard your cassette. Well, there's a misunderstanding about that. I'm not in the cassette business. I don't make cassettes. Um, but wherever I go, it seems somebody's always got a tape recorder running or a video machine or something. and. Uh, they pass these things around and so on uh, but that's not my business and I don't know which cassette you might be referring to or what it was I might have said uh, the talks are not some kind of a thing that uh, I memorized a long time ago and it all just tumbles out I usually write them a few hours before I give them and they're a piece from here and there and some repetition of what's come in the past so if you've heard some of what I have to say before, uh, excuse me, uh, not everybody has heard it though. The topic has been advertised as the history of religion and let me clarify that I don't have in mind to recite to you the details of the history of religion, to tell you in this year so-and-so did this and then there was so-and-so and that kind of thing. That's not what I mean by the history of religion. I'm talking about a view of the history of religion, that we could all gather up the facts as to uh, the sequence of events, but what does it mean? And how did it come to happen that way? And Muslims have a particular view of the history of religion, which I'd like to talk about, as well as the view that other people have. As it happens, the study of mankind, usually called anthropology, of course, has a lot to say about religion. When the anthropologist takes up his subject, part of the investigation of man is man's religions. So anthropology has a lot to say about religion. It used to be that all the anthropologists basically would tell you the same thing if you asked them about religion. You ask them, where did religion come from? How did it come to be the way it is? Uh, they all would give you back the same explanation. But in the last 30 or 40 years, there's been another school of thought developed, which was probably always there, but it's come to be uh, something that has to be recognized, that the anthropologists don't all tell the same story anymore. The oldest school of thought always was to say, well, religion came because human beings have always been afraid of what they didn't know. 
And so what they didn't know, they worshipped. If the thunder and lightning scared them, then they uh, made thunder and lightning a god so that it wouldn't hurt them. If a fire burned them, then they found a god to look after the fire. And so the more primitive the human being, the more primitive his religion. That was what people usually said. Go back far enough and you find people worshipping everything imaginable. And as we come down through history, the religion gets more and more sensible and intellectual and so on. But there have been those who have insisted that that's not what the facts seem to indicate. That actually, if you look very carefully at the history of human beings, it seems that the farther back you go, the more intelligent the religion and that as we come down through the ages, the more degenerate the religion gets. And the people who support that idea will bring all kinds of facts into consideration. One of the things that they point out is that when we examine any group of people, we tend to confuse three different things as all being part of the same thing. We look at their science and their magic and their religion and we think it's all religion when those are really three different kinds of things magic is different from religion because of a very opposite viewpoint magic is when you think that you have some influence over the invisible powers religion works the other way around it's supposed to be whatever invisible powers there are influence you and science, of course, is an explanation of the shape of the world. How does it work? And as it happens, you may find groups of people who have some very strange ideas about how the world is made. And so when people look at them, they say, how primitive. Look how primitive their religion is. But that's not their religion. As an example, I suggest uh, if you ever get the chance to investigate it, it's been documented now. You have a tribe in Papua, the Kapauku, which were only discovered by the outside world in the 1920s. Before that time, this tribe was isolated. They had never met the outside world and nobody knew of them. The Kapauku tribe lived in the island and they thought that was the whole world. Now, if you ask the Kapauku, what's the world made of? How does it work? He may start off by telling you, well, the sky that you see overhead is a big bowl turned upside down, and it's got holes in it. And when the sun goes down, some of the light from the sun shines back through the holes, and that's what makes those lights that look like stars. That sounds very primitive, and so people would be tempted to think, well, the Kapauku is primitive. Well, maybe his science is primitive, but is his religion a foolish item? There was a little book written just a few years ago called The Kapauku of Papua, and it documents in uh, under 100 pages what the Kapauku believe about a lot of things. And here and there it talks about religion. And in every case, it points out something possibly surprising to a lot of people. It mentions that as soon as the Kapauka were discovered, well, the missionaries came running to save their souls, of course. And it mentions here and there how the Kapauka used to argue with the missionaries and used to embarrass the missionaries. And there's the story of one man who was old. He knew he was dying. And he asked his grandsons to help him, one under each arm. He says, take me down. I want to see the priest before I die. I can't die in peace. He went down to see the priest and he asked him, he said, I can't die peacefully until I know the answer to one question. And this bushman, here's a man with a few leaves wrapped around him. You might think this is a primitive man. He said to the priest, you people have such an advanced civilization. Why is your religion so primitive? It's the bushman asking the priest, why is your religion so primitive? As far as the bushman was concerned, 
The missionary's religion was very backward, very childish, very foolish. Because of a number of considerations, some of it is reported in that book, the kinds of arguments that they used to have. It's reported that one day the missionary was reading to them a passage from the book of Daniel, and the tribe started to laugh, and so he said, what's so funny? And they said, read that again, what did you say God was? And so he read the passage where it says, God is the ancient of days, and the tribe laughed. They thought that was quite a joke. The priest still didn't see the joke. He said, what's so funny? They said, did you say God is old? The priest said, yes, very old. And they laughed. They said, you mean he used to be young? You see how the, the so-called primitive man is way ahead of this individual, that young and old are things that don't have anything to do with God. Whatever you mean when you say God, it's not something that grows old. And it was never young either. This kind of thing is in agreement with what the Quran says about the history of religion. It tells us that in every nation, every people had a messenger sent to them to tell them what they needed to know. Which means that the truth has been spread around to everybody. It may have got lost or it may have been corrupted, but it's been given to everybody. That's the Muslim viewpoint. The Muslim is also told in the Quran that there are no new ideas in religion. That is, if you meet somebody that belongs to some established religion, if he tells you something about how his religion works, well, somebody long before him used to say the same thing. You'll still find some people who will tell you, as they come from the church, they'll tell you how their whole system is supposed to work. And the Quran mentions that. It says, when they say, for example, when they say God has a son, they're imitating what people used to say long before them. They imitate the people of old. See, as an example, if I said to you, maybe it's familiar enough to most of you, and I'm sure it is to some of you, if I said to you, what great religious figure was the Son of God born in a stable or a cave at the end of December, who then grew up and he worked miracles, and then he died for the sins of men, but three days later he was raised up. Who is that? Well, as a matter of fact, it could be any of several dozen individuals. Osiris of the Egyptians, Adonis, Bacchus of the Greeks, and Baal of the Babylonians, Mithras of the Persians, they all fit that description. They were all sons of God, worshipped by their devotees, born the last week of December in a stable or cave, died for the sins of men, raised up on the third day, the rest of the story. As a matter of fact, Mithras was worshipped all around the Mediterranean more than 2,000 years ago, a very popular cult of Mithras, and his official title by the people who worshipped him was, he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If that sounds familiar, it's because it says in the Bible that the first time John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So I don't believe John the Baptist ever said that. People have been saying that long before him about somebody else. I don't mean to you know, offend, but what I'm getting at is that if somebody thinks they've got a new story, it's an old story. doesn't mean... But it's a false story. It just means it's an old story. Don't let somebody tell you they've got a new story. It's an old one. This idea of somebody having to die for your sins is part of a lot of religious systems. That somebody will take care of my sin problem for me is part of a lot of religious systems. Other systems say, no, it's connected with my activities and my decisions and my belief. Now, as to the history of religion, approximately half of the story 
I would suggest, is outlined in two verses of the Quran in the sixth chapter. To get the, the context of it, you have to start about the 111th verse of the sixth chapter. These ayat were apparently revealed in answer to a question that the Muslims had 14 centuries ago as the Quran was being revealed. The Muslims felt to be a Muslim is to be guided. The non-Muslims are not guided. But what about the people who say they are Muslims but they don't really believe in Islam? Are they guided or not? They come and go with us and they do all the things we do but on the inside they don't really understand or believe this, are they guided or not? And these verses continue on to explain how that may well be true, that there are among you people who don't believe, but they do everything you do. And the way they get misguided like everybody else is this. The ayah says, for every prophet we have appointed from among men and jinn, devils to come after them, inventing fancy sayings about them, so that those in whose hearts there is no belief in the hereafter will listen to that, that is to the fancy sayings, and they will finish where they are supposed to finish. So the solution to the problem is this, that there have always been messengers, and they delivered some important message, but some of the people who said they followed them didn't listen to the message. They listened to what people said about the messenger. They became fascinated with the one who did the talking, not what did he say. And so they finish up misguided like everybody else. And I stress that that verse says, for every prophet, this is God's plan, the Kuldi Nabi, for every prophet, that would include the last prophet, that there are those who came after him who invented fancy things about him so that people might listen to the fancy things instead of what did he say and finish up misguided. In this way, it's happened in many religious systems that the emphasis switched from the message to the messenger. A man comes, he says something, but instead of listening to that, people start talking about, who was that man? Wasn't he something? And they start falling in love with the man instead of what did he say? This is so much a problem that it even has a name in the church. They call it the kerygma problem. The Christian church examines this under the, the Greek word kerygma, which has to do with preaching. Because the question they ask concerns Jesus. They say, how did it happen that the one who did the preaching became the one we preach about? Or as one man has said, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, and everybody who came after him talked about Jesus. They're talking about the messenger instead of the message. As I say, they call it the kerygma problem. They want to know, how do you pass from one to the other? How did that come to be? What often happens, of course, if the emphasis goes from what did he say to who is he, then in the generations that come after, whichever messenger this is, biographies, stories about the messenger become very important. And people start to compete to who can tell the nicest story about somebody who's now gone. And flattery becomes more and more exaggerated. He might have done a good thing and it gets blown up into a bigger and bigger and bigger thing until it becomes unbelievable. Compare this to what the Quran warns us about. There's an ayah that tells the Muslims, or the reader of the Quran, God says, we raise up prophets, some of them above the others. So there are degrees of importance to prophets. This one is more important than that one, and so on. But there's another verse that tells the believer that we are not to make any distinction among the prophets. So there may be this prophet that's superior to that prophet, superior to this prophet, and so on. But you, the believer, are supposed to treat them all the same. That's a command. It's God who makes the distinctions. 
And you, the believer, have no business saying, well, this one ranks above that one. Ayah says, we make no distinction among any of them. That's the business of Allah, not the business of us. He will make it clear to us, as it says so many times, that on many other subjects, the truth of the matter will be made clear to you on the last day. In the meantime, follow these instructions, and you can't go wrong. So it is that the Muslim reminds himself and others that the priority in the Quran is, as I've said several times in different circumstances, the priority is not to tell the non-Muslim, you should turn your back on what you have and come with me. The priority is first to tell the person, what you have you should re-examine. Commit no excesses. It addresses various groups by names, the Christians and the Jews and the Sabaeans and the Magians and so on, and tells them, commit no excess in your religion. It doesn't say, leave your religion. That's step two, three, or four, maybe, but it starts off by saying, commit no excess. Don't say more than you have the right to say. So if you tell me, as a Christian, for example, points one, two, and three, I might agree with you. When you get to point number four, you may say something for which there's no proof. And the Muslim wants to say, if you can't prove that, why don't you just set it aside? Stick with what you can prove. Because we both believe what you can prove. We have proof. Another thing can follow if a nation becomes so interested in the man instead of what he said. It's an automatic thing that most often uh, comes. If the emphasis is on the speaker and not the speech, racial pride and nationalism start to stir up in people. If the emphasis is on the messenger, so it is that a lot of religions are named after men. A lot of religions are named after the places where they came from. This can be trouble. I'm not saying it always is, but it can be trouble because it means maybe the emphasis is in the wrong place. You're not talking about the message if you're talking about the place where it came from. More often than this, maybe, what happens is in order to compensate for uh, maybe lost pride or something, you may have a group of people who they follow a religion, but the so-called founder or the messenger came from some other place or some other racial background. So as they start to develop their picture of who was the messenger, it starts to get bent into the shape of what they look like or where they come from. As somebody said only a generation ago, God is an American. Like some people will tell you today he's a Republican. He's not only an American, he belongs to this party. So it was that you have a, a movie, which, uh, you know, a cinema, a motion picture that has been around for some time now, Jesus of Nazareth. It's interesting that the man who plays Jesus in that movie has blue eyes. It's extremely unlikely that Jesus had blue eyes, considering who his ancestry was, but the bulk of the people who appreciate him in the part of the world where they made that movie can understand a man with blue eyes better than one with black eyes, I guess. But you see, what causes that kind of shift is that the emphasis is on a man instead of what did he say. So you tend to want to make that man a lot like you. If this, these uh, verses tell half the story, that is, that half the story of religion is because people shifted from the message to the messenger, uh, the other half of the story would uh, just about be covered by another verse in the Quran that tells us about the source of a lot of, of deviation and why are there many religions. It's in the third surah and the sixth ayah or verse. It tells us in that place that the Quran has two kinds of verses in it. That the verses are either muhkamat or mutashabihat. And that verse is quoted by Muslims a lot. Excuse me, they quote half that verse a lot. They don't usually quote the whole thing. They quote enough of it 
to try to tell you that the Quran is a very dangerous thing to read. Only a few people can understand it because, look, some of the verses are Shabi Hat, which they tell you means secret. Only a few people know. You have to trust them to tell you. If they keep reading, that's exactly the opposite of what's being discussed. It tells you that, yes, there are two kinds of verses, but anybody who tells you that they know all about these secret ones, watch out for him. That's the man who will mislead you. It's a warning. There's no mystery about the meaning of that ayah. Muhkamat is one kind of a verse. It comes from an Arabic root that means locked, or locked in place. The root is ahkam. What is locked in place, muhkamat, would be like an item in a piece of machinery that is so tightly fixed in the machine that when the machine runs, it doesn't shake. It's locked in place. Some of the verses of the Quran are like that. It means you can't take them any place, you can't make them mean anything except what they say. The first verse of that chapter says, Allah, la ilaha illahu, that is Allah, there is no deity but he. Now people cannot sit around and argue about what do you think that means. It only has one meaning. That's muhkamat. That's something like, it, it, the better word in English might be explicit. When you go to a shop and the sign is hanging on the door and it says closed, you don't turn to your friend and say, what do you think is the meaning of that? How do you interpret closed? It, it says what it means, there's no discussion, we all know. That's explicit. And some of the verses of the Quran are said to be moved to Shabihat, which comes from a verb in the Shabha that means could be. Muqa Shabihat. Sometimes it's translated in English as ambiguous. I don't like that, really. Uh, maybe a better word would be consimilar. It means it has a sh shared similarity. To sacrifice a cow, and they said, which cow? They all look alike. You mean this cow or maybe that cow? And that sentence is built around this same verb, Shabha. The Jews were saying, it's not clear which one. It could be this cow or it could be that one. In the same way, some verses of the Quran could mean this or they could mean that. If, as this verse goes on to say, you take these verses apart from the ones that are locked in place, then try to give them a meaning and you'll go astray. It says the muhkamat are the basis. The ones that are locked in place will lead you through the ones that can be ambiguous. As they could mean this or they could mean that. But they can't have two meanings if you compare them to the ones that are locked in place. What happens to... Well, I'll give you an example. There is a man in uh, South America, in Guyana. He wrote a little book to the Muslims saying that according to the Quran, Jesus is God. And he proves it by quoting about seven different verses from the Quran. But you see what he did was he tears those verses loose from their context and quotes them to you. If you put them back where they came from and compare them to the verses which are clear, they can't mean what he says they mean. The same kind of thing has happened then in so many times and places. When people have been given clear sayings and some sayings that are not quite so clear, they leave the clear and they pay attention to those things that can be bent this way or that way. Left behind the, the things that would guide them straight and took the things that they can shape into whatever they like. This, by the way, is not a defect in the Quran. If that ever occurs to somebody to say, well, maybe all of the Quran should have been uh, kamat, all locked in place. The simple reason it can't is because the Quran, unlike most religious scriptures, talks about the Quran. It talks about itself. It mentions Quran by name 70 times and by other names and descriptions many more times. So when you have an item which is referring to itself, some verses have to stand on top of other verses. If each verse stood all by itself, you don't have a book anymore. You have 3,100 pieces, that's all. The Quran is a united thing that's woven back upon itself. That's why some verses have to depend on other verses. 
In any case, what I was trying to get at is that you have a situation, for example, the Quran says, who pledges loyalty to the messenger pledges loyalty to Allah. Now, if you took that verse loose from the Quran, you might say, you see, this means Muhammad is God, stuck for Allah. Because it says, who pledges loyalty to the messenger pledges loyalty to Allah. You could bend and shape it however you like, but put it back where it came from, consider all of the verses that are very clear on this subject, you realize whatever it means, it doesn't mean that. Now, compare that to what a person will do if he takes hold of one of the reported sayings of Jesus where he said, who honors me honors God. And people say, oh, you see, he was God. That's what he said. If you honor me, you honor God. Because I am God, is what they wish he would have said, but he didn't, he didn't finish that way. So it may mean that, but put it back where it came from and compare it to the other things he's reported to have said, and whatever it means, it can't mean that. It's reported that he said on one occasion, there are things which God knows which I don't know. Now, whoever says that isn't God. God knows what I don't know. So I'm not God. It seems like the only way you can understand that. So what happens when you take a verse and you give it a meaning, like who honors me honors God means he's God, and you're confronted with another one which clearly indicates that, no, who said this can't be God. Well, what people do is they give it a label and that makes it go away. There's a collection of things like that where Jesus says, for example, God is greater than I am, and God knows what I don't know, and I never said a thing except what God told me to say, and so on. They put that in a collection. It's called the difficult sayings of Jesus. It's difficult, all right. It's difficult because it doesn't fit with these other ideas. But to give it a label doesn't make it go away. That's something like uh, if you have a problem you can't solve, you work on it for a long time and then decide, oh, I know what I do with this. I put it in this box labeled unsolved problems. There, it takes care of that. This is an unsolved problem. That doesn't finish the matter. It seems more likely that the labels ought to be switched, if anything, that the things which people say are clear are actually the ones which should be causing them some difficulties. The things which they call difficult are the ones that are clear. Statements like, God knows what I don't know is very clear. That ought to be labeled clear. And then the other one doesn't look very difficult at all. Whatever it means, you know what it doesn't mean. From here, we could discuss a continuing difficulty that comes right down to today and whether you talk about religion or anything else, one of the leading difficulties in any subject is the problem of communication. That is, the meaning of words causes conflict and confusion. To give you an example, people today may say, uh, Jesus is the Son of God. Son sounds like an easy word, all right, and everybody knows what a son is, but it means a lot more than that to somebody who says Jesus is the Son of God. There's an interesting document that has come down through the, the years from about 17, 16 or 17 centuries ago. It was written by somebody in the Roman Empire who was complaining that people in his day were arguing about the sonship of God or the fatherhood of God and this kind of thing because it was such a complex meaning to the words father and son that that's all people talked about. He complained. He said, when you go into the market and you buy a loaf of bread, when the baker hands you your change, he says, is the son co-eternal with the father or consubstantial? Whatever that means. And he went on to give more examples. He says, as you pass in the street, you greet somebody, good morning, and they say, does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and the Son, or does it proceed from the Father alone? That's all anybody talked about. He was complaining about it. He says, I can't leave the house, and that's all I hear. Somebody's saying, well, does it work like this, or does it work like that? It was such a complex thing that people were struggling over about 16 or 17 centuries ago. 
He was fed up. But the problem comes with what do words mean. They can cause conflict within groups of people, or they can cause confusion when one group of people tries to talk to another group of people. Simple words that you hear all the time have special meanings to some people. Not long ago, somebody came to me after a talk and he said, uh, what has God revealed to you? And I said, well, he revealed what he wanted me to know. He told me his will, what he wants. He says, yes, yes, I know that, but I mean, what has he revealed to you? I ask him, what do you mean, revealed? He said, revealed the first time. What is revealed? revealed. So the same word now has to be inflated, you see, and it means a whole lot more, which, in fact, he can't even tell me. What he means when he shakes and quivers and puffs out this gust reveal is something to do with, uh, didn't it happen to you maybe late one night and God came into your room and he touched your heart and you shivered and boiled and you rolled on the floor or whatever it was? To him, that's revelation. Well, that's more than the dictionary says. Reveal means you, you take the veil off. So you've unveiled something it's from the same origin as that word. I mean, something was covered up and now it's revealed. Uh, what you didn't used to know, now you know. But when you say revealed, it's something more than that. And there's many words like that. They get inflated to mean more than they must. And of course that can take people astray because they're carrying around a whole family of ideas when they hear a word which aren't really contained in the word. It's what happens even to, if you're talking to somebody who has no religion, they puff up the word sometimes. You can get into quite a discussion with somebody about trying to defend something and he's talking about an inflated word and you go right along with it. Fat as he makes the word, you make it fatter. I'll give you an idea or an example. Perfect. You hear people say, God is perfect. Well, look up the word perfect sometime. See what it means. Perfect. It means does the job. It's appropriate. It's enough. Perfect. No defect. But people blow up that word and they start making all kinds of difficulties for the one they're talking about. Say, well, if he's perfect, he can do this and he can do that and so on. That doesn't have anything to do with the meaning of perfect. I'll show you what I mean. Like, if I said to you, I have a, a perfect car, a perfect automobile, what do I mean by that? Probably, I mean, uh, it starts every time I turn the key and uh, it runs smoothly and uh, it's not rusting and so on. But if you start inflating that word perfect, you can start making all kinds of demands. If your car is perfect, you don't need to drive it. It drives itself. As a matter of fact, it should go and do your grocery shopping for you. If it's perfect, doesn't it come in the house and tuck you in bed at night? If it's perfect, it goes and does your work for you. you keep blowing up this word perfect. Well, people do the same thing, especially the, the atheist tries this trick when he talks to a religious person. He says, if your God is perfect, he can do this, he can do that, and the other thing. And all those things don't have anything to do with it. Perfect. God can do anything. They say. That's a very silly thing to say. You see, where people get into a problem with words is, they confuse difficult with impossible. See, there's nothing too difficult for God to do. But some things are impossible because they don't mean anything. You could say of a man, um, can a man pick up a car? Is it impossible? No, it's difficult, very difficult. It's difficult because of the limitations that the man has. It's not entirely out of the question that a man could pick up and tip a car over by himself. Now when you're talking about deity, you talk about God, there's nothing too difficult that is something too heavy, he can't pick it up or whatever. But some things are impossible because they don't mean anything when you say them. What does it mean when I say a square circle? What is a square circle? Well, there's no such thing and God can't make a circle square. 
Because if it's square, it has corners, and it's not a circle anymore. If it's a circle, it doesn't have corners. They're just words that you string together. It's the, it's the kind of thing that careful people have been aware of for centuries, that there's no end to the words that we can string together, put one after the other. That doesn't mean they make any sense. Something has to have a meaning before you say, is it possible or not? If you don't understand that, this is where people can lead you anywhere they like. And I have to wonder, what is the Koran for anyway? The Koran talks about the things that cannot be so. It tells you why they can't be so. It gives you arguments to you. So that when somebody says this, you tell him that. This is the reason that can't be so. It tells you as an example, I guess I used the other night, one surah starts off by telling us as an oath, it says, by the even and the odd. It's reminding us that even and odd are different things. And you'll never find something that's both. If it's odd, that means it isn't even. That's what odd means. It means it isn't even. I tell you, I have about an odd number. I mean you can't divide it by two. And nobody can make it work because of what the words mean. You see, where that usually comes back, or where people try to use that, is the Muslim may take all of these wonderful arguments in the Quran, and he may give them to somebody who says, for example, that God is three. And he says, look, it can't be so because of this and this and this, all Quranic arguments. God cannot be one at the same time three because of these reasons. And the man says, your God is too weak. My God can do anything. He can be three if he wants to. Do you know that kind of argument demolishes itself in this way if a man says to you God is three you ask him why is he three he'll tell you that's his nature that's the way he is always been three that's the way he is and when you try to explain well how can something be three and yet one and three and so on then you say because God can do anything well think about it if he can do anything then he didn't have to be three he could have been one or five or seven or whatever or it could be 11 tomorrow and 12 the next day and start over again, the day after that. If he can do anything, which means it isn't his nature, that's not the way he has to be, it's the way he decided to be, which is different than what he started off telling you. He started by telling you his nature is three, he finishes by telling you he decided to be three. Well, which is it? The attitude as I say, of confusing what's difficult and what's impossible, lets people get away with anything. It's what puts a stop to any kind of a reasonable discussion that you can have. There are people who will tell you, my God, at one time, was a little boy and went to school and learned things. So your God learned things? Well, no, he knew everything. He's God. Well, then what did he learn? Well, he had to go to school. He learned things. Round and round they go because of a passage they have in their scriptures that speaks of this one they say was God because when he was 12 years old he went back with his parents and learned he grew in knowledge they tell you yes well God did that he learned some things and when you say but what was it God didn't know that he learned say, oh nothing he knew everything and round and round that's why some people wrap up all those ideas and they put it in one phrase and because they can string words together it sounds like maybe they solved the problem I tell you all theology is paradox a paradox is a, a thing that seems to contradict itself in fact it comes from two words that mean to speak against speak back against so they tell you, well, science works like this. It makes good sense, and so does everything else. But when we come to the study of God, it doesn't make sense. That's what makes it theology. You see, everything else makes sense. You talk about God, no, that doesn't make sense. That's different. All theology is paradox. As one man who's regarded as being a very saintly individual by a lot of people, he said 17 centuries ago, the reason I believe it is because it's absurd. Silly. 
because it is absurd, therefore I believe it. The problem with that, of course, is that if what you're supposed to believe is absurd, how do you decide which is the silly thing you're supposed to believe? See, there's a lot of absurd things that contradict each other. The truth is one kind of a thing. It's only one version. There's a lot of things in conflict that are false. How do you decide which crazy thing is the true one? If you can't use your mind to decide between true and false. That's part of the good news of the Koran, the good news of the, uh, this message. It tells mankind, trust yourself to know. In effect, it's saying, you will recognize truth when your mind is switched on, not when it's switched off. Telling you, 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 you want to find out what you need to know, you'll find it when your mind is on, not off. It doesn't mean we don't all make mistakes. But what we do know for sure is we don't find it with the mind switched off. So, by way of maybe some advice, I'll try to suggest that that attitude should grow in a person so that he gains some confidence, so that he's not frightened by what somebody else might say to him. He doesn't get scared by the big vocabulary somebody has or which school did he go to and so on. So many examples of people who thought they knew something and it was the humblest sort of a person by his appearance who just blew him away. A friend of mine was telling me how years ago, he's from Sudan, he said there was a man, he'd gathered quite a crowd around him and they were all silently listening to him talk about the wonderful way that one political system is supposed to work and they thought he must know what he's talking about. He's got all these credentials and all these letters after his name. And the whole point of his speech was to say that uh, in this system, everybody is at exactly the same level. See, there are no leaders. Everybody's exactly the same. That's how it works best. And while he's telling the crowd this, a farmer came by pushing his little vegetable cart, and he stopped, and he listened for a bit. What's this man saying? Nobody else has got the nerve to speak, and this man put up his hand. And so the man looked at him and said, you had a question? He said, oh, I want to ask you, have you ever looked at the fingers on your hand? See, are they all the same length? See, they're all different lengths. That's why it works better. If the fingers are all the same length, it wouldn't work as well. And just that quickly, he showed the man that maybe you ought to think again about a political system where there are no generals and no presidents and no leaders or anything. Everybody's at the same level. Will it work? Your hand wouldn't work if your fingers were like that. If your head is clear, it doesn't matter who you're talking to. You don't lose arguments because of what you don't know. If your head is clear, you can take whatever is told to you and give it back and use it. Don't be frightened. Maybe the challenge is not in talking to people about religion, unless you're trying to defend your, your own view. Sometimes people think they've got a lot of very clever things to say, and they haven't thought them through, but they hope to frighten you with them, to give you some examples. As I said the other night, probably the best thing to do is when somebody gives you some thing that sounds very deep is to take it and apply it back to what he just said, apply it to itself. Like the example I mentioned the other night was there is a philosophy that's widespread. A lot of people think they figured it out for themselves for the first time in history. They say you can't be certain of anything. There is no certainty. When they say that, they're imitating a man who lived about 23 centuries ago, who was probably imitating people who lived before him. His name was Pirho, a Greek, who said there is no certainty. You know, that might even be true. But can you be sure? That's what you want to ask somebody who says that. He tells you, look, the reason I don't uh, dabble in religion and that is you can't be sure of anything. I've had people tell me that and ask him, are you sure? I say, I'm positive. He apply it back to itself. He's so sure that you can't be sure of anything. There's a lot of dead ends like that. 
are people who come to me frequently and say, I don't believe in God. You can't prove there is a God. Well, as one man has said about 60 or 70 years ago now, he said, people who start off with that statement have already skipped a question. They said God, but what do they mean when they say God? Which God do I have to tell you I believe in? What I always tell people when they say, I don't believe in God, I usually say, which God don't you believe in? Tell me about the one you don't believe in. Probably I don't believe in him either. After you explain him to me, you mean the God that sits on a chair with a long white beard and rolled up his sleeves one day 6,000 years ago and made man and huffed and puffed and had to sit down and rest after that? That's the God you mean? I don't believe in that one. And so on. Many other uh, ideas that people have. The key question comes before this. What do you mean? You said God. You tell me about this God I'm supposed to defend to you. So it is, in fact, that if you really do not commit excess, if you don't say more than you have authority for saying, the Muslim may find himself in a position sometimes, I, I, <laughs> I've had it happen, when you explain what it is you believe about God, people will say, I thought you had a religion. That's atheism. There's no God there at all. Because that's one of the attributes of Allah. al latif has a shade of meaning in Arabic. It means um, the subtle. It means whatever you say about God, you must say this, he is al latif He's so subtle, he almost isn't even there because he's so unfamiliar to anything that you might have in mind. Whatever you think he is, well, you're wrong. Al-Latif. Uh, a related word is used in Arabic when they talk about uh, the fabric that's gossamer, the kind of, uh, it's fabric, but you can read the newspaper through it. It's one of the attributes of Allah. Very subtle. So, what I'm trying to get at is, you may often be frightened by people who try to tell you, well, religion works like this, and I can figure it out, and anybody who still has a religion today is pretty primitive. The anthropologists don't always tell it that way. The people who study men don't always point it, uh, or tell it a story that way. I tell you, in fact, that the most intelligent men have been the ones that maybe we used to think were the most primitive. And the Muslim is in the happy position of not being embarrassed by all that information. The more he hears about the history of religion, the more the truth comes out, the more his iman grows. Because when facts are discovered, they tell him more of what he knew already. I'll tell you one last example of that. A couple of years ago, I finished giving a, a lecture, and a question very came. Somebody stood up, and he's waving a book in the air, and he says, You Muslims, dare not let me read this book. He's trying to challenge. He says, there's information in this book which your ears couldn't stand to hear. So the chairman said, well, I'll give you two minutes. Read what you want. For two minutes. Oh, he was really happy. And he started reading as fast as he could. And what he was reading was the documentation that long before 14 centuries ago, the Arabs used to follow the religion of Abraham, as Ibrahim. He was filling in all the details. He said, there's proof in this museum and in that ancient inscription, and you go to this place, you find this and that and all this, saying which professor and which archaeologist found all this information. He read as fast as he could for two minutes. Finally, the chairman said, oh, it's two minutes. Oh, but he was happy. He thought he'd exposed Islam as being some old thing that was brought back to life 14 centuries ago. And he sat down, and I said, uh, thanks very much. I said, that was beautiful. That makes me happy. It increases my belief. And he was really upset about that. He said, they wasn't supposed to do that. I said, why not? So the Quran tells me that since there have been men, there's been Islam, and now you're bringing me proof. You're telling me that Islam isn't 14 centuries old. It's much older than that. That's what I've been trying to tell a lot of people. And they tell me, no, no, it started with a man 14 centuries ago. Really upset about that. And he said, no, no, no. He says, if a religion is a true religion, it will be a new religion. Who says it is telling people what they didn't know before. Which is an interesting idea because one only has to remind a person of the methods used by Jesus. He didn't tell the Jews anything they hadn't heard before. 
He told them about the resurrection of the dead, and he rehearsed the stories, and he was always saying, it's written in your book, such and such, and so on, so. By this man's own standards, this must have been a fake man. He was an imposter. He didn't tell them anything new. He told them what they heard before. Try to remind them of it. It's just a, a case of, as I say, using what you hear if your mind is alert. If it's the truth, it works for you, not for anybody else. If your head is clear. So those are some thoughts uh, till now. I thank you for your time and attention, your patience. May Allah bless and reward our efforts. Please, please take advantage of this opportunity. Don't let it pass by. Yes, sir. Full of secrets, uh, and uh, to the Muslim, it's not. It's not full of 